all the way from San Angelo, Texas, to your front porch. It's Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. Radio worth listening to. Brought to you each weekday from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time right here on the Gospel Radio Network. Your host, Brother Rafael Ramirez, Rick Pope Joy, and Mike Bonner. And joining us every Friday from San Francisco, California, will be Brother Omari French. Sit back, take another sip of that coffee, open up your Bible, and join us as we reflect upon the precious book, Divine. I can tell that my brethren around here have a great sense of humor. <clears throat> I did not graduate in 04. Uh, that's uh, 1984, not 1904. <laughs> but uh, what a sense of humor to sing uh, this beautiful song uh, before this particular lesson indeed that, uh, uh, well... I guess we'll see when we get started here, but uh, uh, I found it uh, quite refreshing to be able to sing that this world is not my home when, in fact, the common errors that we will address over the next uh, couple of days, this being the first of those uh, common errors in regards to heaven, (coughs) excuse me, with regards to the Jehovah's Witnesses. That means that as the first of a series of lessons that there will probably be some commonality in relationship to the errors that you will find, whether that be of Mormonism, Islam, Catholicism, or the AD 70 movement, which are uh, some of the common errors that will be addressed during this particular series of lessons. But I also want to, uh, at the same time, Uh, give my uh, gratitude to the elders for having the uh, foresight and uh, the boldness not only to address in foresight the wonderful topic of heaven itself, but to have the boldness to address the common errors that are associated with the Bible doctrine of heaven in regards to what false teachers have surmised over the years. And uh, it has come uh, common among uh, many, even in the Lord's church, to shy away from any kind of controversy whatsoever. And so I appreciate the boldness with regards to the elders here to be able to address such things as this. Now with that in mind, what I would like to do uh, in the uh, time that we have Uh, for us scheduled uh, at this time is to first of all look at a historical background, a brief historical background. I want to look at a theological background. You know, it's it's interesting to me that false doctrine in one area is not stagnant. It it, uh, manipulates other doctrines that surround it. And so that you find when you get off on one particular error, that if you're not uh, 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 corrective of that, then that false doctrine will lead to other false doctrines, thus the danger of uh, being off. And so we want to look at the at least uh, briefly a theological background in regards to that. And uh, then I want us to uh, hone in a little bit more clearly on uh, some of the... Uh, items that we need to address, and then I want to hopefully have the time to deal with some practical matters. That is, what do we do with the information that we now possess uh, in our uh, minds? And so let's deal uh, very briefly with the historical background. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, was begun by uh, Charles Russell in 1872. Uh, and uh, it was uh, bred about in his mind at least because he had some of the same difficulties that people have today. He could not fathom a loving, gracious, 
merciful God uh, putting someone in a place of torment, of eternal hell fire. And so because He could not uh, 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 bring those and merge those two, by the way, magnificent doctrines together, because He could not see from a Romans 11, uh, 22 mindset of the goodness and severity of God, because He could not do that, then He decided to drop the severity of God, which is kind of interesting. Why not the goodness of God? But that's a different lesson altogether. So because he could not do that, he decided that one had to go. Well, he began to publish these ideas in 1879 uh, when he published or co-published a magazine entitled The Herald of the Morning. Uh, That would later be uh, changed to what you and I know today as the Watchtower and uh, announcing Jehovah's Kingdom and uh, that track society that would be built upon that. By the way, the first Watchtower magazine only published 6,000 copies each month. That's how it started out. Today, according to their records in the publishing house in Brooklyn, New York, that they actually churn out 100,000 books and 800,000 copies of two magazines daily. This is a a doctrine that is being disseminated around uh, the world uh, in a uh, a, uh, strong way. And so it needs to be addressed. Uh, People have uh, been... uh, Well, you have... Right? You have received that knock on the door, right? You have answered the door and uh, those Jehovah's Witnesses we're at your door. And so uh, it is important that we address this. Uh, it is indicated, uh, according to their own society, that it takes 740 house calls, as they put it, that are required to recruit the nearly 200,000 members who join this organization each year. And so certainly a historical background uh, breeds within us a necessity to deal with such a topic as this. But let's think about this theological background now. How do we get to where we are today in addressing some of the common errors uh, surrounding uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine uh, regarding uh, heaven? Well, we certainly understand that by the name itself, that uh, they are individuals who, and I I don't want to spend a lot of time on these because my subject matter is not dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. My subject matter is more honed to their view of heaven, but I would suggest to you that these are all interlocked and interwoven together. But they believe... See, when you get off on the nature of God, It is amazing how widespread your false doctrine will be. And uh, so because he could not comprehend the nature of God as being both good and severe, just and the justifier of them which believe in Jesus Christ, then because he could not reconcile that, the nature of God was the very first thing that was attacked. And so now the nature of the Father is what you and I oftentimes see as a false doctrine in name. That is, they believe that God's one true name, the name by which He must be identified, is Jehovah. And yet there are at least 700 names, titles, and descriptions of deity that are found in your Bible. The very first is in the beginning God, Elohim. That's not Jehovah. Elohim created the heaven and the earth. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 1, God appeared unto Abraham as unto or as El Shaddai. Later, this is important because God Himself, from a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, will tell Moses that I did not appear unto your forefathers by the name of Jehovah, 
but by my name El Shaddai. You see, it was not an exclusive name under the Old Testament. And in fact, because it is a Hebrew name, it is never used in the New Testament. The, the apostles and, uh, are often referring to, G, uh, referring to God as the Father. That is, when it distinguishes Him. And so, uh, we are to pray not to Jehovah in the sense of using that specific name, but we are to pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, when you get off on God the Father, then that's naturally going to get you off with regards to God the Son and God the Spirit as well. If God the Father is the only exclusive uh, person who possesses uh, the, uh, the divine nature or the Godhead, then uh, the Trinity is also going to be attacked by these individuals. They believe that it's unbiblical because the name does not appear uh, in uh, Scripture. But I guarantee you the concept does appear in Scripture. Each of the three possess the attributes of deity. We don't have time, and that's not our lesson. I just want to show you the chain that binds these items together. So that means that they are off in regards to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, uh, at least from the Jehovah's Witness point of view, believed that Jesus was a created being. That He was created by Jehovah as the archangel Michael before the physical world existed and is a lesser, all, uh, excuse me, a lesser yet mighty God. Little g, by the way. And you'll find that in their translation in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And uh, so uh, they would... But might I just make a, a side note here uh, in regards to this. Uh, they say that He is mighty, but He is not almighty. Let me give you uh, Isaiah chapter 40. And verse number 3 is a prophecy concerning uh, John the baptizer. And John the baptizer had a specific prophetic mission assigned uh, to him. And so... In Isaiah chapter 40 and uh, verse number 3, this forerunner of, uh, uh, it says, the voice of him that crieth into the wilderness, prepare ye the way of, the word is Jehovah. In the King James, you will find the word Lord in caps. That's Jehovah. It is, he's going to prepare the way for Jehovah. He's going to make straight in the desert, a highway for Elohim. So here we have a Hebrew parallelism to where Jehovah and Elohim are equivalent names for someone that uh, uh, John the baptizer is coming to prepare the way for. Matthew chapter 3 identifies that he is coming to prepare the way for Jesus. Thus, Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is uh, 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 Elohim. John chapter 1 identifies Him as Creator as well. And so, He can properly... Jehovah is not the Father's name, and Jesus is the Son's name. That's not how this works. They all possess the nature of the divine, and that means that Jesus is properly and rightfully referred to as Jehovah and Elohim, which, by the way, if you tie in Exodus chapter 3, Jehovah says, Before I appeared unto your forefathers is what? El Shaddai. <laughs> Wait a minute. The translation of El Shaddai is not mighty. Almighty is the translation there. He is the blessed and only potentate in regards to... That's a side note. Let's get back. Well, if you're off on Jesus Christ and He was a created being, guess what? You're going to be off on the incarnation as well. They believe then that Jesus was born on the earth, 
but was a mere human and not God dwelling in human flesh. Seeing that our brother dealt with Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9, in Him dwelleth the Godhead bodily. We don't even need to go there at this moment in time. So, that means that they're going to be off on the resurrection. You see how all these tie in together? If you're off on the nature of God, you're going to be off on the resurrection. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was resurrected, yes, but spiritually from the dead, not physically from the dead. I, I have a question uh, for my friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse number 11. The, uh, uh, the apostles are going to be proclaiming a resurrected Lord. The Sanhedrin get a message in this text from the soldiers that were at the grave. They tell them the story of the events, the historical element of what occurred. And they say, Hell, we will give you money if you will tell everybody, and we will protect you from death if you tell everybody, while you were asleep, the disciples came and stole the body away. Now wait a minute, if Jehovah's Witness doctrine is true, the body is still in the grave. Why didn't the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 2? You could stop Christianity in its tracks if they would have drugged the body of Jesus out of the grave and slapped it down in front of the disciples and said, Now tell us that He's resurrected. They didn't do that. You know why? Because they didn't have the body of Jesus. Well, that means they're going to be off on the second coming. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the second coming wasn't invisible. By the way, if Jesus was resurrected uh, spiritually, and uh, then guess what? Ours is going to be uh, twisted in regards to that as well, and it's going to be an invisible spiritual event. By the way, that occurred in 1914, so it has already occurred. No sense in really talking about the resurrection anymore, because it has already occurred. Yet the Bible says that every eye shall see Revelation chapter 1. And verse number 7. Well, that means they're off on the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, but I want to get to this point. It means that they're going to eventually have to develop a doctrine that is going to explain all of the elements that are invested in our hope. And they're going to do that by addressing or utilizing the statement of a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you and I both know that they believe that the 144,000 in Revelation is a literal number, right? We understand that. But they actually believe that there are two peoples of God uh, that are identified in Scripture. There's the anointed class, that's the 144,000, and they... Uh, will go and live in heaven and rule with Christ. And we'll get to this in just a, a, a second on the details of this. But the other sheep, that is all the other believers, will live on earth in a paradise. And we'll talk about the specifics of that in just a minute. You see, they do not believe that human beings possess an immaterial nature. Uh, they believe that the soul is simply a life force, that when death occurs, it is sent back unto the Father. It leaves the body and thus is nevermore. And so their doctrine of hell is certainly going to be off as well. This is where uh, uh, Charles Russell began with that concept, false concept of, of hell and not being able to uh, put together in a biblical format the goodness and severity of God. So they believe that hell is a place of eternal, is not a place of eternal suffering, but rather a common grave for humanity. They believe that the wicked will be annihilated. Uh, there, there will be actually no conscious existence of the wicked at all. And uh, so it is good for us to at least examine or have a journey through uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' mindset in regards to how we got from Charles Russell to today. Now, on their website, uh, I found uh, some of this information came, at least these points, and everything came directly from their website. So I'm not taking anything out of context. I want you to understand this is what they teach, 
And they are very proud of their false doctrine. They will come to your door and knock on it to tell you about their false doctrine. They will spend millions of dollars of their money in order to tell you about their doctrine. They are proud of their false doctrine in regards to that. Now, uh, a couple of questions that I found interesting on their website that may help us in clarifying a few matters. Who goes to heaven? is one of the questions. And of course, the answer is that God has a selected number of faithful Christians who after death will be resurrected in uh, uh, heaven uh, uh, for eternity. Not all Christians, you understand. The selected is not all Christians. The selection comes out of those who are faithful Christians and the rest of us will spend an eternity in a human paradise on earth. Which brings to my attention at least... Why? If it did not work in the first place, what makes someone think that it'll work in the second place? That is, if the paradise of God in the beginning did not keep man from sin, and death occurred out of that, then what makes us think that this earth and an earthly abode... You're talking about carnality and a fleshly mentality of the eternal things, then this is it. And uh, so that is their answer in regards to that. First Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 5, by the way, is the verse that they listed on their website, so I want to share it with you at this time. He says, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for some of y'all. Right? Is that what your Bible says? It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say reserved in heaven for some of y'all. It says reserved in heaven for... You, all y'all, is the ideal there. So he says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be reserved in the last time. Now, I want to tie these two passages together because in Second Peter chapter 3, even some of my brethren, and I'll get to that later, but even some of my brethren are now struggling with the new heaven and the new earth being a renovation of this earth and just being a replicated earth once again. God's going to just wipe out all the corruption and crime that occurs and the curse, and then we're going to repopulate in regards to this earth. Uh, that is, a, by the way, a Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Uh, but Peter has to agree with Peter. Wouldn't we all agree with that? So if Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3 that we have a reservation in heaven, then the new heaven and the new earth must agree with that statement that we are all going to be, that is the faithful in Christ, the faithful are going to be in heaven with God. That's where Jesus is and that's where He's going to be. And so it's important that we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. They must be harmonized or Scripture means absolutely nothing at all. Now here's a question. Those 144,000 that are up there, what are they going to be doing? Why are they up there and we're down here? What are we going to be doing down here? Here's their answer. Listen, I'm giving you a quote. I'm, I'm not... Uh, I, uh, this is their quote. They, that is the 144,000, they will serve alongside Jesus as kings and priests for a thousand years. They will form new heavens or heavenly government that will rule over the new earth. That is, an earthly society. Those heavenly rulers will help to restore mankind to the righteous condition that God originally intended. That's their purpose, you see. Isn't this going to be interesting? Can you imagine? 
those heavenly rulers now. That's going to be the Supreme Court of heaven. That's going to be our Congress while we're here upon the earth. I find a great deal of difficulty with that when I read my Bible, right? Uh, every Scripture that talks about those that will be in heaven are those that describe the entirety of the faithful of God, not a select few in regards to that. And uh, so uh, maybe a few questions that might help us along the way. I must hasten because I have a long way to go and uh, I have a short time to get there. So uh, what about heaven here upon this earth? You know, we do need to deal with their doctrine in particular. There are distinctions that are clearly made in Scripture uh, showing us that there is a distinction between uh, heaven and uh, earth. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and uh, verse number 14, the Bible indicates that uh, there is such a place as the heaven of heavens. And you'll find that terminology also in Psalm 115 and verse number 16. There is the heaven of heavens and then there is the earth. Now, I realize, as our good brothers already brought to our attention, that the word heaven in your Bible actually has uh, multiple layers to it. That it not only describes, uh, when it's specially used in the plurality, or in a particular nature, contextually, that it might apply to the air that we breathe and, and this particular uh, existence that we have here, that it can refer to uh, that which is outer space. So you have inner space and outer space. I don't know if that's a technical term. Uh, I don't know if NASA actually uses inner space to refer to our atmosphere and the sky and things such as that. But you have the inner, and then you have the outer, and then you have the heaven of heavens. You have the place where the throne of God is, Habakkuk chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse number 20. So it is important that we be able to see the distinction. Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse number 34 is Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount about... Uh, making oaths. He says that a man should not make an oath based upon heaven. Now, why not based upon heaven? Because that's where the throne of God is. Nor can you make that oath based upon the earth because that's the footstool of God. One is the throne room of God. One is the footstool of God. You see, there is a distinction that is being made between that which is the heaven and that which is the earth. Jesus taught His disciples, did He not, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10, to pray that Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now you and I both realize from our vantage point that has been accomplished. But from their vantage point, it had not been accomplished yet. So they were praying for thy kingdom to come. And uh, later on, he's going to say, uh, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Notice here in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 6, and uh, notice the distinction uh, that is being made here. He says, Lay not up for yourself, verse number 19, treasures upon earth. What happens on the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, this is what takes place in heaven, there is neither moth nor rust that can corrupt and thieves cannot break through and steal. For where your treasure is, earth or heaven, uh, is uh, where your uh, where your heart will be also. And so he is making a distinction. The Christian hope, we mentioned this just the other day, Sunday night, in Colossians chapter uh, 1 and verse number 5. In Colossians chapter 1, and, uh, uh, verse number 27. Notice 1 and 5. He says, uh, uh, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Where is our hope? It is in heaven. Our hope is not to somehow, uh, as they would say, and some of our uh, 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 brethren are now saying, that uh, the whole point of the resurrection is uh, so that we might go up into the clouds, 
meet with Jesus while God destroys and renovates and gets our, gets our home ready here upon the earth. And then Jesus is going to come down here to this earth with us and forever our home will be. That's not what the Scriptures teach. And so it is important that we understand our hope is not on the earth. It is not in a renovated earth. It is here in, or it is there, excuse me, not here. It is there in heaven. And uh, so we need to understand uh, those things. Now, let me uh, hasten along here. <sighs> Philippians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. In verse number 20 in Philippians chapter 3, he says, For who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body? Not according, uh, not according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. He's talking about our body in a resurrected state. But wait a minute, back up to verse number 19. He says, concerning the enemies of the cross, the false teachers, He says, whose uh, end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation, our citizenship is in a renovated earth. Is that what your Bible says? Take your head, no. It says that it is our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our hope is. And so by His death, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 20, He dedicated for us, right, a new and living way through the veil. Study the book of Hebrews. We don't have time this morning. Study the book of Hebrews about that veil. Study about where Jesus went. And that's where our hope lies. It doesn't lie. He didn't make that, uh, that sacrifice uh, in, uh, beyond the veil in the Holy of Holies uh, on a renovated earth. He made that before the very throne of God. Read, uh, read Revelation chapter 5. There John opens up this scene and he sees one as a lamb and uh, later we are told it was slain from the foundation of the world. There in heaven before the very throne room of God there is the sacrifice. There is beyond the veil. and There is the most holy place where you and I shall be. Now here's the question that we need to conclude with. What are we going to do with this information? Well, some of us may hear it. That is, it goes in this ear and it goes out this ear and never will it impede our thinking again. Uh, there, I'm, I'm hoping that that's not the case with us. I'm hoping the case that we can take that information and actually do something with it. But the first thing, and this is why I appreciate the elders' boldness in this, is that it demonstrates their willingness to do what the Bible says, even on difficult subject matters, such as dealing with false teachers, pointing out that there is error in this world, pointing out that there is wickedness and wicked men who want to utilize men for their own uh, 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 services. Second Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. They want to make merchandise out of you. So the Bible indicates that we have to be individuals who are willing then to research the situation. We have to find out whether or not these uh, prophets that have gone out into the world are real or false, which means that we have to try the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. That we need to be able to deal with them on a personal level, but also on a public level, these individuals, it is important for love's sake that you be warned about all of the dangers that are in this world for you. And so I appreciate the love of these elders wanting to mark false teachers and false institutions that are outside. Did you catch the title of the lesson? Common errors, you see. And so it is a common error to believe in Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine regarding heaven. 
So we must do that. But now I'm compelled also to appreciate the fact that if we truly love one another, that it also means that we have to love one another to warn each other of even some of our own brethren that have gone off into these particular doctrines. We must, as Paul says in Romans chapter 16 and verses 17 and 18, we must mark those that teach error that's contrary to sound doctrine and that we must avoid them. Now you cannot avoid them unless you are willing to mark them. Somebody's got to point them out for others to see. That's what the word scopeo means. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rifle mentality where I've got my scope set on that deer right there, you see. That's him. And uh, that's what we do with false teachers, those that are within and those that are without uh, the body of Christ. But especially Romans 16, 17, and 18 of those within the body of Christ. Now, some might say, well, these guys aren't around here. So maybe you don't need to say anything about them. Well, that was false in the first century before the Internet. And it's certainly false today. When we have immediate access to the entirety of the world uh, through one particular device, some of these individuals, if not most of them, are individuals that have great influence in a brotherhood that is being duped to believe their false doctrine. So there are some today, even in the Lord's body, that are teaching a renovated earth, a Jehovah's doctrine, Jehovah's Witness doctrine concerning uh, the renovated earth. Wes McAdams of the Plano Church of Christ is one of those individuals. He has a huge following on his website. And it's amazing to me. Listen, elders need to uh, wake up to some of this stuff because our young folks are being driven away from the church by some bloggers that are out there and uh, individuals that uh, uh, make their websites look all fancy and pretty and they say prettified words. And they're leading people astray. Out from underneath our own noses, we wake up one day and we say, wait a minute, where did you get that from? You've been here for 18 years, you've never believed that. No, but I saw this blog and uh, uh, we've got to wake up to some of that. Wes McAdams is one of those individuals at the Plain Old Church of Christ. With him is a guy by the name of John Pappas of the Laverne's Church of Christ in Laverne's, Tennessee. They have a video out on this very subject teaching and propagating this doctrine of a renovated earth. Now, there are some that may be less known to you uh, than uh, some others, but Jed Lovejoy and Dan Owens of uh, the Church of Christ in uh, Broadway, or Broadway Church of Christ in Kentucky, Paducah, Kentucky, are also promoting this on a web level. And so they're influencing a lot of people in regards to this with the name Church of Christ associated with that. That is false doctrine. And it needs to be marked. Clint Brown. Clint Brown of Farmersville, Texas. Uh, by the way, appeared uh, on PTP this year. Uh, they were not aware of his false doctrine. This is a recent development. Uh, but he has come out very strong uh, in regards to a renovated earth in regards to these things. And he's also a well light individual with regards to his doctrine. Then there's one other, and that is uh, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez in regards to this. And I still have to learn how to turn that off. Gabriel Rodriguez of the Shenandoah Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas. And this saddens me because I've been on the Shenandoah lectures many times. Don Walker used to be the director of that wonderful lectureship as well as others. And yet this man and the elders back him in this is now teaching an annihilation theory in regards to where the wicked go. You see, he in his mind begins where Charles Russell began some years ago, that he cannot believe that a good God would ever cause anyone to spend an eternity in hell and to be punished 
in such a fashion as that. Now that's just one aspect. That was my buzzer. I must go. So let me briefly give you these items. I'm talking about practical items. Practical. You ought to beware lest you fall into the same condemnation as these reprobates. This is what Second Peter is all about. It is a forewarning. So that when you get to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 17, he says you remain steadfast. But don't fall in that same manner, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Je- our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Continue to study your Word, the Word of God. Continue to uh, study it and apply it and grow thereby. And because of that, you will be better prepared to deal with these individuals. And we ought to put one another in remembrance of the present truth of what the Bible teaches. I appreciate so much this lesson dealing, this theme, dealing with heaven. We need to put one another in reminder what heaven really is and how good heaven really is. The, the last couple of lessons have been amazing in regards to that. But my friends, you never forget that there are individuals out there that they want to snatch your soul. The devil's behind all of that. And he wants you to spend eternity in hell with him. And you will if you grab a hold of one of these false doctrines. I love you, I care for you, and that's the reason why I bring you this item. May God bless your study of God's Word and your practice of Christianity. Flashlight. Wallet. Timer. Notes. Button. Hearing devices. Music recognition. Selected. Screen recording.